Let's pretend for just a moment that it is a Saturday and I'm in my garage and I'm looking at my car and I decide, wow, I think I need new brakes. So I get out my manual and I look at it and I think, that seems way too complicated. Let's just get that wheel off and now I'm looking at it and, you know, it looks like that thingy goes over here and those brake pads need to come off and maybe I can pry them off. And I pry and I get them off. And Jerry Britton's having a cow over there, aren't you, Jerry? I know. (laughs) And I'm trying to put the new pads on and they're just not going on, so I obviously just need a bigger hammer. And I beat them and I get them on and I put the wheel back on and I move to the other side and do the same thing. How how many of you want to ride with me in my car? (laughs) Nobody has a death wish this morning, huh? We don't do that with cars. We don't do that with most things. But why is it when it comes to marriage that we say, well, you know what? That maybe is what God says, but let's just kind of chuck that aside and see if we can't figure out a way to do this on our own with our own implements. And I would remind you that as we continue on in our series in marriage, that there is a designer, and he has a design for marriage. And if we don't look at his manual, if we don't try to figure out how he says things ought to be put together or repaired, we're going to end up in trouble, like my car. We become at marriage one flesh. The moment you're pronounced husband and wife, that takes place. But we also saw last week there is a process of becoming one flesh too. And it's a lifelong process. And I think sometimes we struggle with that because we as men, you know, we have our to-do list and we look at it and we said, okay, engage, check. Married, check, I'm done. Now I can stop because we've accomplished the goal and we forget that that is an ongoing process. And ladies, I'm not going to let you off the hook either because many of you have planning books for your wedding. Sometimes you've had those planning books and those plans before you ever met the guy. But you had the whole thing planned out and he just had to kind of plug in there at the end. And you think, okay, it's my wedding day, and the wedding's taking place, and I'm done. But you're not. Married or single, we need to understand what the design is by the designer for creating unity. Marriage is a created unity. And so you and I who are married and those of you who are single... We need to go back to the Word of God and follow His design. Our text this morning is in Ephesians chapter 5, but before we get to Ephesians 5, we need to back up to Ephesians 4. Because Ephesians 4 sets the context for what we're going to see in chapter 5. In fact, Ephesians 1, 2, and 3, where Paul lays out the doctrine, now he wraps it up as he transitions into how do you live this out And in chapter 4, he writes these words. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. That's chapters 1 through 3, the calling. Now he says, live that out. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That is not a passage that is just about marriage, but it certainly is about marriage. Live out the calling and the salvation that God has given to you and do it in such a way that you do it with humility and gentleness and patience and love and work at that unity. Marriage is a created unity. Yesterday I had the privilege of 
of officiating at Ben and Allison's wedding, and one of the things that I talk to them about in premarital counseling is the moment I pronounce you husband and wife, you will not immediately be united and blended together in everything. That's a lifelong process. We need to think about how do we create that unity. And Ephesians 5, familiar passage, helps us see the design of the designer and what he wants us to do. Notice what Paul writes, Ephesians 5, verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so wives should submit in everything to their husbands. And some of you, probably the female element here, are saying, oh, wait a minute. Hold on. Because you see, we approach that text with, with what the experts call cultural noise. Cultural noise is what happens when you meet someone who speaks another language, is from another culture, and you're trying to communicate, and the language and the culture and the traditions serve as a, a barrier there. And we in 21st century America come to this passage and we have cultural noise. Because you see, we read that word submit and this is what we think it means. Walk all over me. That's what the wife is supposed to do, right? That's what that verse is saying. That's cultural noise. That's not what the verse is saying. We read, wives, submit to your husbands. And in our mind, we have a picture something like this. Here's the caveman, and he's dragging her along because that's what it means. She's got to just be dragged along in submission. That's cultural noise. That is not what Paul is saying in Ephesians 5. So I beg you, before you reject the manual, before you toss it aside and decide to get out a bigger hammer, let's think about what God really is saying about how we develop and cultivate unity in a marriage. God calls a wife to be a submissive follower. That is true, but let's think about what that means before we react to it. Because what we need to see from this passage is that submission is a choice that a wife makes. Too often there, there's been this idea that this passage, Ephesians 5, is designed as a club that husbands use to beat their wives into submission. That they hold it over them and say, look, God says you've got to submit to me. But do you see that in the passage? Is that what Paul says in Ephesians 5.22? He speaks not to husbands, but to wives. And he says, wives, you need to choose to submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. That last phrase is important, too, because a wife doesn't submit because her husband deserves it. Let's just be honest, men. There are times when we don't deserve for anybody to submit and follow us. But that doesn't matter. It's not submitting to us because of who we are. It's submitting to us as to the Lord. Ladies, it's doing that because God asks you to do it, not because your husband orders you to do it, not because it's the accepted thing in the church. It's doing it because God has asked you. It is His design. And your husband may not deserve it at that moment. He may not deserve it most of the time. But unless he is telling you to do something that is contrary to the Word of God, you are called to be a submissive follower. I also want you to notice that this is a choice that a wife makes. This passage does not say women submit to men. It says wives submit to your husband. It is a choice that a wife makes at the moment of, well it begins to happen I guess with engagement, but at the moment of marriage she makes a commitment, a choice to say yes I will come underneath the leadership of this man and I will follow him unless he tells me to stop following God. It is a choice that a wife makes to elevate her husband's direction over her own, 
to elevate his direction for the relationship, his direction for the marriage, his direction for the home over what she thinks ought to be happening. Now notice, this says absolutely nothing about the wife's value. It is all about role. It's all about what she is called to do by God. It has nothing to do with how valuable she is. Remember, we looked at these verses a few weeks ago. In Genesis chapter 1, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female, both created in the image of God, equal in the eyes of God in value and worth, different in role. So in chapter 2, in the elaboration of that creation, God says, it's not good that man should be alone. I will make this woman as a helper that corresponds, that is suitable to him. So she has a different role than man. Her role is to come alongside, not subserviently, but alongside of him as his helper, as the one who helps him to do what God intends him to do, which means following his leadership. Paul says, or Peter says rather, in 1 Peter chapter 3, even in the context of where he's talking about husbands and wives and wives submitting, he reminds men that husbands and wives, we are heirs together of the grace of life. There's no difference in our spiritual standing before God. That's what Paul's talking about in Galatians 3 when he says, in Christ there's neither male nor female. doesn't mean when you get a when you accept Christ as Savior, those differences are erased. It means that spiritually speaking, we stand equal in the eyes of God. But God has given men and women different roles in marriage. And it didn't come about because of the fall in Genesis 3, because in Genesis 2, God speaks to Adam and commands Adam not to eat of the fruit of the tree, and he expects him, which he apparently did, in turn to share that information with Eve. Even before the fall, Adam is the leader in the relationship. There was an older author on marriage back when I was thinking about marriage, and we were in our early days of marriage by the name of Tim Timmons. And Tim Timmons says, head, leader, ultimately means buck stopper. The buck stops on the desk of the husband. And it is the wife's responsibility then to come underneath his leadership and to help him accomplish what God wants him to accomplish in that home, in that marriage, in whatever other roles and places God places them. By God's design, there is a leader in the marriage relationship. And that's a good thing. Have you ever seen pictures of animals with two heads? I mean, it's not a pleasant thing. They're on, on the internet because it's kind of a weird thing to see something with two heads. And a marriage with two heads would be a problem because you'd have one head wanting to go this way and one wanting to go that way. And God in His sovereignty and His wisdom sets up the marriage relationship so that there is one who has responsibility to lead and one who has responsibility to come underneath and to follow and to support and to encourage. And so verse 24 says, The wife is to submit in everything, but that little everything is mitigated, I can't say the word, mitigated somewhat by the fact that she is to submit to him as to the Lord. So she comes underneath his leadership in everything that does not violate the word of God. So God calls a wife to be a submissive follower. And that's how unity is built within a relationship. What does that look like? Please understand, that doesn't mean that she is barefoot, pregnant, and in the kitchen. That's kind of the cultural noise again, talking. That's what it means for her to submit. It doesn't mean that she doesn't voice her opinion. It doesn't mean that, that she never says, look, I don't think we ought to do that. Those are all things that she is free to do, but ultimately when the decision has to be made and is made, she comes under the leadership of her husband. And ladies, there's a sense in which that's freeing for you. Because if you think it's the wrong direction, but it's not unbiblical, and you come underneath his leadership, if it's the wrong direction, guess who's responsible for that? It's not you. You can stand before God and say, 
I did my role. And, and he led us this direction, and, and it wasn't wrong biblically, but it wasn't really probably the best, but I followed. I listened. She uses her abilities and her talents and her gifts to help the direction that is set by her husband. Proverbs 31, that beautiful description of what a godly woman is like, is not designed, ladies, to make you feel bad because you don't do all of those things. It is meant to say to you, look at all that you can do as a godly woman who is there to encourage and lift up the direction and the leadership of her husband. You can voice your opinion, you can share your concerns, you can even object, but when the decision's made, you come underneath his leadership. You don't seek to manipulate, to argue, to pout, to give him the cold shoulder, to do all of those things to get your way. You say, I'm going to follow him as he is following God. So let me ask you, ladies, how do you talk about your husband to other people, especially to the lady friends that you have? Do you build him up? Do you talk about him as the leader, as the one that, that you are thankful for, that God has given to you to offer protection and direction in your marriage? Or do you kind of run him down for what he's doing? When was the last time you thanked him for being the leader in your relationship? And you say, well, he isn't much of a leader. Well, find some place where he is and thank him for that and praise him for it. You might be surprised how much more leadership he takes when you do that. When did you last tell him how much you respect and honor him? Because that's actually the word that Paul uses at the end of this section, verse 33. He doesn't use the word submit. He uses the word respect. The wife needs to see that she respects her husband. Those two things go hand in hand because as she comes underneath his leadership, what she's saying is, I trust you. I respect you. I see what God is doing in your life, and, and I want to be part of that. I want to come alongside you and, and help you to be and to do what God intends us to do together. And ladies, that is a powerful, powerful thing. You may think manipulating or other ways are powerful, but demonstrating respect and telling your husband you respect him and showing that you respect him is one of the most powerful means that a wife has to encourage her husband toward what God intends him to be. Let me talk to the single guys who are here and over in connection just for a minute. Guys, if you are single and you're thinking about who should I marry? One of the things that you ought to look for is how does that young woman respond to the other authority in her life at that point in her life? How does she respond to her boss if she has one? How does she respond to her parents and her dad in particular? How does she respond to the authority of leadership in the church? Because how she responds in those realms probably tells you a lot about how she's going to respond to you when it's your opportunity to be a leader. Now, you're not her leader. You're not her leader until you say, I do, and I say, you are. Then you're her leader. <laughs> but you ought to look and see beforehand, how does she respond in those situations? Because what you want is a woman who recognizes that God has given her a specific role in a marriage relationship of being a submissive follower. So that's the ladies. You'll notice in this passage, Paul talks more to us as men. And honestly, i got to be honest, man, I, I'm more comfortable talking to us because I am one and I know where we struggle. But there's cultural noise with what Paul says about us too because he says we are the leader, we're, we're the head, and, and we get this cultural noise of, of, of men who take that passage and start beating on their chest and saying, I am leader, woman, follow you know, that kind of thing. Or maybe like this. I'm the boss. To save time, assume I know everything. <laughs> and probably could add to that, and I'm right. That's cultural noise. That is not what headship means, all right? So, guys, don't go home and say, me, Adam, you, Eve, follow. That's not it. The other extreme is just as bad, and we saw it a couple of weeks ago with Adam in the garden. The other extreme is men who don't lead, 
who are simply passive, who are content to just lay on the couch with the remote and let life and family pass them by. Those are the two extremes in our culture, and and what we're called to is to read God's manual and pull it back into balance, back to the middle. So what does God call us as men to be? God calls husbands to lovingly or to be a loving leader. God calls us as husbands to be a loving leader. And that means... That what we focus on in verse 25 is, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And we come to understand that loving is a responsibility that a husband takes. See, we tend in this passage, it's really interesting because it starts off with, you know, wives, submit to your husbands like, Christ, the church does to Christ because he's the head. And we tend to focus and say, well, this is about man as head and man as leader. But that's not what Paul talks about, is it? What he focuses our attention on, men, is the loving part of it. Probably because he knows that for many of us, taking charge and being leader comes naturally, but the loving part, maybe not so much. We tend to focus on leader, but the command is to be lover, to love And this is not the fickle emotion of love. This is the love of choice. This is the agape love of choosing to do what is right for the other person, whatever the circumstances are. And you need to understand how revolutionary this was when Paul wrote it. I mean, most of us, we've been around church so much, we know this passage. You know, some of you heard it at the wedding yesterday. We're so familiar with it. It just goes in one ear and out the other. When Paul wrote these words, Roman and Greek men had no responsibility in a marriage. The wife submitting, yeah, obeying, yeah, that was part of the culture. But the man, he could do whatever he wanted to do. And so for Paul to write, husbands, you have a greater responsibility to be a loving leader would have stunned some of the people who first read Ephesians. What? I don't get to just do what I want in this relationship? No, you are called by God to lovingly lead. It's a responsibility that when you say, I do, you accept. That may explain one of the wedding pictures in our album, and I thought about putting it up there, but I was afraid you couldn't take the shot. It is Peggy and I standing at the front of the church. The pastor has just pronounced us husband and wife and introduced us. She is grinning from ear to ear, and I look like a deer caught in the headlights. (laughs) And I think it is because at that moment I was realizing I just accepted a massive responsibility. Life wasn't just about me anymore. I was now responsible for a bride And I thank God for her and the fact that she came underneath my leadership when I didn't know what it meant to lead a wife. But it is a responsibility, guys. When we get married, we take that responsibility to lovingly lead our wives. So what does that mean? I think it could be boiled down to this statement that Paul explains by three other examples. Loving is a responsibility a husband takes to elevate his wife's needs above his own. Say, wait a minute, I thought I was leader. You are. You are a leader who's called to elevate his wife's needs above his own. How does that play out? Well, verse 25 tells us. Love your wives like Christ loved the church and gave himself up for it. As men, as husbands, we are called to give up our lives for our wife, just as Christ gave up his life for the church. He's the example for us. Back in verse 23, he's called the Savior of the body. That's probably too strong a word for a husband, so Paul doesn't use it. But the application is there. As men, we are called to protect our wives to protect them from others who would physically harm them, protect them from others who would emotionally harm them, from harsh criticism, to protect from all kinds of things. You you have to know what your wife is vulnerable to 
so that you can protect her. One of the things that Peggy and I do pretty regularly is sit down and look at our calendars together. And one of the things that she has done over the years when, when somebody wants her to take a responsibility is she's come to me and said, what do you think? It's not because she doesn't have a brain. She's got a great brain. It's because she recognizes that she can overcommit easily. And as the buck stopper in the relationship, she can come to me and I can say, you know what, I think you have enough on your plate. And then it's an easy out for her. She can go back to whoever it is and say, Bill said no. <laughs> but that's a way of me protecting her from overcommitment. And, and that comes by knowing what your wife needs, which means men, as Peter says in 1 Peter 3, we need to dwell with them in an understanding way. Usually, guys, it's the lesser sacrifices we struggle with. Lay down in my life, I can do that. That's macho. Take a bullet for it, I can do that. that. That's pretty tough, manly. But maybe it's more like, you know, dear, I appreciate the fact that you die for me, but in the meantime, could you do the dishes? Could you change the diaper, take out the trash? See, that's tougher, isn't it? It, it would be easy to be the macho man who dies for his wife, but to lay down what we want to do and our agenda to serve her, that's the tougher calling. To give up the ball game or give up the TV remote or give up the hobby or give up the gun and the camo or the bow and the camo. I know it's dangerous territory this time of year. So that you can minister to her. We say, well, when do I get my time? Dying men don't ask that question. You and I are called to lay down our lives for the benefit of our wives. Look at verses 26 and 27. Christ gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Now, a lot of those terms apply specifically to the holiness of the church. But I want you to notice how he piles up terms like cleansed and splendor, no spot, no wrinkle, holy, without blemish. And he applies it back to husbands and wives by saying, you know what, guys? It is our responsibility as husbands to cultivate our wives so that they become all that God intends them to be. It's our responsibility to build into them and develop them to the woman that God intends them to be. As a husband, you are, I am, a key tool that God is using to grow your wife to be more like Jesus Christ. Let that sink in for a minute. Now, it may be that your orneriness and your sinfulness and your selfishness are molding patience into her, but hopefully it's not that. Hopefully you are molding godliness into her by your own following of Christ. So do you pray for your wife? Do you know what to pray for for your wife? Do you encourage her to grow spiritually? Do you exemplify spiritual growth in your own life so that you as her leader are demonstrating a godliness that flows to her? Do you talk about spiritual truth with her? If I can just be honest for a minute, when our kids were growing up, it was fairly easy, and it's never easy, but fairly easy to have family devotions. We called it Bible time, and we got the kids together. And then as their schedules got tougher, it got tougher. And then they left, and you would think, well, that makes it a lot easier for us to pray together. But it didn't. And we wrestled, we struggled to find a time because I'm up and out pretty early in the morning, so that wasn't going to be a good time. And at night, we tried that, and, and we could talk about things and pray about things, and, and I would lay down, and in five minutes, Peggy would say one minute, but five minutes, I'm asleep. And she would lay there and think about everything we talked and prayed about. And so that wasn't working. So we finally hit upon the three or four, whatever nights a week where we're not rushing off somewhere. It's just the two of us at dinner. 
we finish dinner and we spend some time talking and praying together, praying for some of you, praying for our family, praying for missionaries. And we don't do it every day. Life doesn't allow that. But, but it's important, husbands, for you to find a way to spiritually build into the life of your wife. She needs that, and you need it. Encourage her to be here at church. Encourage her to do a Bible study. Shelter her from the kids if they're home so she can have quiet time with the Lord. Encourage her to get involved in Life 101 or other things that that spur her on towards spiritual growth. And it's a continual task, by the way. The uh, having cleansed is past tense. Might sanctify is present tense. And might present is future tense. So it's, you know, yesterday, today, and ongoing until the Lord takes one of us home. There's a third way we love. It's almost as though Paul says, okay, I've given you the standard of Christ, and and I know none of us are going to reach that. So let me talk to you practically about another way, another standard of loving your wife. So look at verse 28. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. If you can't love her like Christ, Paul says, at least love her like you love yourself. Because most of us men, we take pretty good care of ourselves. Looking around, you're all men, you're all dressed fairly nicely. You don't look like you've missed too many meals and uh, look like you're, you're doing okay. Because we do that naturally. We take care of ourselves. And Paul's point is, she is you. And he takes us right back there to Genesis 2.24 again. We've seen that just about every week. Where one man, one woman come together and they become one in the eyes of God. So that she really is you. She really is your flesh. And so you need to nourish her, provide for her, build her up, encourage her. You need to cherish her. The word literally means to keep her warm. And Michigan winter's coming, so that may be a role. But the idea is you take care of the needs that she has, spiritual needs, physical needs, emotional needs, working to provide for her and her basic needs, helping her so that she doesn't get overwhelmed. Sunday morning, you're getting the kids all ready for church, and she's in there still trying to get them ready, and you're outside being really helpful by honking the horn on the car because she's not out there yet, right? No, maybe you ought to be in there helping to get them ready. Not being harshly critical of her. Words of affirmation and encouragement are important to a woman, guys. And when we criticize, when we're critical, that tears her down instead of builds her up. Not suspicious, not micromanaging, listening to her. When you say, we're going this way, and she says, wait a minute, I'm not sure that's the best way. Then listen to those concerns. Take them and evaluate them, and maybe God will use that to turn the direction. And if not, at least you will have heard her before she follows you. If she has things she needs done, get them taken care of. This cartoon in various forms has been floating around the internet and and there must be some truth in it or it wouldn't keep floating around. Ladies, if he says he will fix it, he will. There's no need to remind him every six months about it. (laughs) And if that's out there, that must mean there's some truth there. And a lot of a woman's emotional connection is to her home and we're People come to see her, and she identifies with it. So get that project done. That's a way of loving her. God calls a husband to be a loving leader. About six months ago, I got an email from a man, and I want to read it to you. It says, do you remember about two or three years ago you gave a sermon or you challenged husbands to take a week? And every morning, write a short note to their wives, encouraging, thanking, mentioning something about them they appreciate. I thought, yeah, I vaguely remember that. Which, by the way, I'm not making that suggestion today, but it's a good one. You could do that this week. Well, I took your advice. Every morning, I brought, wife's name, some coffee on a tray with a love note. 
That turned into a regular practice. Now, I don't, I don't deliver a note every morning, but I do get up every morning unless I have a very early appointment and make breakfast for the two of us and serve it to her in bed on a tray. We take some time just talking, enjoying each other's company, and reading some scripture and praying for the day. This practice has been a big boost to our relationship and our marriage. Not that our marriage was not good, it's just gotten better. Now, man, you need to know your wives. Because if I brought Peggy breakfast in bed, that wouldn't be a happy thing. It's not what she's about. It just isn't. So you need to know what it is that says love to your wife. And uh, Jessica yesterday encouraged Ben and Allison to read Chapman's book, The Love Languages. And if you haven't done that, if you're not familiar with that, it's a good idea. What is it that says love to her? And that's what you do, and you pour it out over her so that she becomes everything God wants her to be. That's leadership. That's servant leadership, which is always the model in Scripture. She's not a doormat. She is the focus of your service as the leader. And as she comes underneath your leadership, you elevate her up so that you seek her best to the glory of God. Might be easier to take a bullet. Might be easier to die for her. But we're called to lay down our lives continually for our wives. I talked to the single guys earlier. Single ladies, let me just talk to you for a minute and say to you, you need to look for a man who has your growth and your benefit at his heart. And if he is selfish before you're married, he'll continue that pattern unless God changes him by grace. And if he is pressuring you now to disobey God, to cross lines sexually, he doesn't have your best interest at heart. And he probably isn't the guy you ought to pursue or allow to pursue you. Unity in a marriage. It is a created thing. A wife has to be a submissive follower and a husband has to be a loving leader so that the wife is saying something like this, I'm going to give up the other paths that I might pursue as a single woman and I am going to willingly come underneath his leadership. And the husband is saying, I am going to lead this woman with a self-sacrificing love that makes her into all that God intends her to be. And it's not too hard to notice that the focus in both of those is the other person. Not saying, well, this is your role and you'd better submit, but saying, this is my role to help you grow as a husband to a wife. Not saying, well, you'd better lead, but saying, this is my role as a wife to come underneath his leadership and to encourage and to respect him as he moves ahead in what God has called him to do. And when we make the other person, the other spouse, the focus of our attention, then there's a beautiful picture that takes place. That was what Paul was talking about in this passage, that the relationship between husband and wife is a picture of the relationship between Christ and church. And when you and I as husbands and wives love and lead and submit and follow, we demonstrate to a world that's out there that needs to see it what Christ-like character and love is all about. But I have to tell you, everything I've talked about this morning is impossible. It's impossible in your own strength and in my own strength, which is why we need to remember the context in which Paul writes this. Because back in Ephesians chapter 2, he says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. You need God's grace at work in your life. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. You need to know Christ before you can act Christ-like in a relationship. And if you are here this morning, if you're watching on the internet, and you don't know Jesus Christ as Savior, that's the first and biggest need that you have to repent of your sin and come to Christ. 
And if you do know Christ, you need to continue to be going back to the, the grace that was demonstrated and given to us at the cross for grace and strength to do those roles because though it was easy for me in some ways to talk about them this morning, it is not easy to do them. But I want you to notice verse 10 of Philippians or of Ephesians 2, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. There's the answer. God has made us new in Christ so that we can live out these roles. Created in Christ Jesus, Four good works. Well, what are those good works? Ephesians 4 and following, including Ephesians 5 and the role of husband and wife. Which we, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We can't do it without the grace of Jesus Christ, but with his grace we are called to walk in that relationship with Christ doing the good works that were laid out ahead of time for us as husbands, as wives, to the glory of God. Let's pray together. So, Father, I could stand here again today like a deer caught in the headlights because the responsibility of being a godly husband is beyond me. The responsibility of being a godly wife is beyond the ladies who are here and husband beyond all of us men who are here, and yet it is what you've called us to do, not in our own strength, but because of what Paul wrote about earlier in the chapter, the filling of your spirit that enables us to live lives that are beyond our own strength. So help us as husbands to be loving leaders. Help the wives to be submissive followers. Help those who are single and and walking with you to continue to grow in that so that they're ready if you bring someone into their lives. And help all of us to lift our eyes beyond ourselves and our own inadequacies and our own failings, beyond the the failures of our spouses, and look to you. For you are our God in whom we trust. We pray in our Savior's name. Amen.